Salve te omnes, and welcome back. In this video, we are going to be going through Aeneid Book 6, lines 384 to 425, following that AP Latin syllabus, putting it into English, going over some grammar and stylistic devices, and saying salve to Kerberos on our way down to the depths. Before we begin, as always, let's review our color coding. Any word that you see in red is going to be acting as a subject. Words in green are verbs. And any word that you see in blue is acting as an object in context. And so with that out of the way, let's get into it. We resume our story after a short scene that we don't read in Latin, during which time Aeneas meets a deceased crew member, Palinurus, who was taken by Neptune in the crossing from Sicily to Italy proper, and Aeneas never even knew he was gone. Renowned for pietas indeed. But regardless, we pick up in line 384 with Aeneas and the Sibyl, the plural subjects, completing their journey so far. Ergo, iter inceptum peragunt. They complete the journey that they had begun, and they draw near to the river Styx, fluvio que propinquant. Fluvio, by the way, is marked as an object despite the fact that it is dative because propinquare is one of those verbs that likes datives, and so that's why it's acting thus. As they approach, our boatman friend returns, good old Charon, who spies them from afar and speaks first. Na vita quosiam indut, all right, tells us that now the boatman did something to them, the quos implying the plural subject from before, Aeneas and the Sibyl, and then we see in the second half of the line, stugia prospexitabunda, that he spied them from the Stygian water or wave. Prospexit, by the way, being indicative and not subjunctive, is how we know to understand ut as meaning either as or when, in this case, perhaps as soon as. Uh, we know that the ut is temporal and not purpose or anything like that because of the mood of the verb. Line 386 is telling us what Charon actually saw. Per tacitum nemus ire. He saw them, that would be the quos, going through the silent grove, pedem quad vertere ripai, and turning their step, literally their foot, but we mean their step, toward the shore, with ripai being another of those datives of place to which. Seek prior agreditur dictis, and Charon, the Navita, he approached them first, prior, with words, dictis, ablative of means, in this way. This is just a nice way of saying that he spoke first, at quin crepat ultro, and he chided them ultro, voluntarily, or something to that effect, meaning that Charon did not wait for some reason to speak to these, these oncomers, but instead he got out in front of them before they could say anything and shared his thoughts. And let's scroll down now and see exactly what it is Charon has to say. Quis quis es, whosoever you are, armatus qui nostrad flum in attendis, you who, the qui of course being quisque, quis quis, armed, comes towards our river. Nostra is, of course, being the royal we here, so we could read this as my river. Farage, two imperatives. Fare from for fari, meaning to speak, and age from good old ago, meaning to do. Fare is easy enough, it means speak. Age is something more like, come on now, or do it. Do it. Not really meaning much, but designed to add an insistent note to what's being said. Quid venias? Why are you coming? Yam istinket com prime gressum. Now, back to that place, turn your step. Right? So, don't even bother coming any further. Continuing on is simple enough. Umbra rik locus est. This is the place of the dead, of the shades. Somni noctis quesoporai. Again, locus, the place of sleep and of sleepy night, right? Somnus being sleep itself and sopori with noctis being night that makes you sleepy. Corpora viva nefas. The first half of this line is plain enough to understand. Living bodies forbidden. But then the rest of the line finishes the thought. Stygia vectare carina. 
So there's an est missing here naturally. There's also probably a mihi missing as well, implied. It is nephos. It is forbidden for me to carry living bodies upon the boat of the Styx. Stugia carina. And now, continuing on, we are going to get justification for Charon's unwillingness to ferry his visitors across. And, of course, there are mythological references. Charon cites two times that he was forced to carry the living across the river, and things didn't work out so hot. Notice that Orpheus apparently doesn't count, because we see Heracles and we see Theseus and Pirithous, but maybe Orpheus' story comes later, chronologically speaking. Anyway, there's a fun litotes to get us started in this next line. Nec vero, we're going to leave this for one second, sum laetatus, truly I was not thrilled. And that's what's going to drop us into indirect speech here for this next portion, which is why me, plainly accusative, is indicated as the subject of akepise. So, uh, it, I was not thrilled indeed when, we might say, I received Alciden, which is a fancy way of saying Heracles, Hercules, going upon this lake. He was traveling. I received him upon this lake. Nor was I Lytatus when I had to Akepise, Thesia Pirithumque, Theseus and Pirithus, referencing the two other people that he has had to carry across the river before. Uh, and fun fact, Pirithus never made it back, so he's still there. Uh, so is Theseus by now, he's dead too, but Pirithus never got back from his trip down to the underworld. Disquam quam genitat quin victi. Right? We just get a whole big, massive line here talking about how even though they were born to gods, both Heracles and Theseus, uh, and in Wicti, and then we understand the rest of it, Wiribus Essent, even though they were born from gods and unconquered in their power, Wiribus here being an ablative of respect, not quality, because in Wicti requires that. Charon then goes on, to talk specifically about what each of these characters did that got him into so much trouble and why he is now so opposed to ferrying the living across the Styx. Ile, right here, is referring to Alcidon, it's referring to Heracles, because we have two people that were mentioned. We have Alcides up here, and we have Thesia Pirithumque up here, leaving aside the fact that Ile is singular and these two are plural. We remember that Hick and Ile, this and that, Ile will always refer to the farthest away thing. So never the closest thing. That's what Hick will refer to. So when we see Ile, leaving aside the fact, singular, plural, leaving that aside, we know that we're referring to the first person mentioned. That would be Heracles. So he, that guy up there, what did he do? Tartareille manu. He was doing something in Tartarus with his hand. Uh, and of course, we know the story, Custodin Winkla Petiwit. He was seeking or pursuing the guard of the underworld, which we know is Kerberos, uh, in chains. He was seeking to put him as something that's missing. We might read a ponere or something in here, or copere. He was seeking to seize the guard of the underworld in chains. Okay, continuing on here, we have to remember what Heracles is doing. Ipsius a solio regis. He was seeking him from the very throne or from the throne of the king himself. Traxitque trementem. And he dragged him, Kerberos, away trembling. Poor little puppy. He, in the next line, will therefore be referring to Theseus and Pirithus. Dominam Ditis. Now, the mistress of the underworld is, of course, the queen of the underworld, Proserpina or Persephone, Thalamo de Duceradorti. They were seeking or sought, we might understand a sunt missing here, having sought to drag her off from her bedchamber, from her bedroom. So, the two previous living visitors to the underworld caused or in, their, in Theseus and Pirithus's case, tried to cause great harm to the underworld. So naturally, Charon is not in a hurry to have that happen again. Moving along now, the Sibyl, Amphriziawates, has a response ready for each of Charon's objections. 
quae contra breviter fatast, right? In response to these things, briefly she spoke. Really quick, there is an argument to be made for this quai to be read as the object of fatas, as if it were hike, she spoke these things. In this case, I don't know why, but I just read it as going with contra, maybe a little prolepsis with a preposition. You do it either way, however you feel comfortable, in which case this would refer to the things that are coming down here. But normally we would see hike for that. So I read the quai as in the things that were just mentioned, that is to say the things that were above. So that would make it the object of contra. All right, in response to these things that we just heard, she spoke briefly. Um, if you want to read this as if it were hike, which would be looking down, forward, then you would read this as the object of fatas. She said these things, but it's entirely up to you. Just wanted to explain why I don't have quai indicated here as a neuter plural accusative object, just a neuter plural. Uh, the Amphrisi of Ates. This would be the priestess of Apollo because apparently we are supposed to understand that this adjective amphrisia is in reference to a river where Apollo once herded some cattle, because everyone knows that. Anyway, the Sibyl is responding directly to Charon's complaints before bragging on Aeneas a little bit and then pulling her trump card anyway, which makes us wonder why she spent all this time saying all this other stuff. But here we go. Nullic insidiae tales. There are no, we of course read a sunt in here, right? There are no such traps here, she says, before giving him a brief little command, absiste moeri. Quit being upset. Just calm down. Nec wim teleferunt. Nor do weapons carry power. So they're not, they're not carrying any, any violence by means of weapons. Tela is the subject of ferunt, and whim is its object, uh, referring implicitly to the idea that Aeneas might be armed, which he is, but coming with arms to do harm. Liket in gens janitor antro. The liket we're going to come back to in just a second. We understand that it means it is permitted or it is allowed. Um, we're going to come back to it in one second because there's an oot missing, which is going to uh, drop us down here to the subjunctive teriat. But we see the ingens janitor antro. We see the massive doorkeeper, that of course would be Kerberos, in his cave. All right, And something is permitted for him. The oot, which should be here after liket, is often omitted, even in colloquial Latin. And the presence of the subjunctive allows us to immediately understand what is going on. So, important note, by the way, ingens janitor is not the subject of liket. Liket cannot have a subject. It is impersonal. Ingens janitor is actually the subject of teriat. So, it is permitted that, and then everything follows from this. The massive doorkeeper in his cave, uh, aeternum latrons, barking eternally. This is an adjective in the accusative being used as an adverb. Ex sanguis terreat umbras. He is permitted to go on terrifying the bloodless shades. And then we move on, having dealt with the idea that Kerberos might be in some kind of danger, we move on to the second objection, castaliket patrui. Just with these three words, we understand what's going on, because we know the story of Proserpina and Theseus and Pirithus. The liket here again is missing its oot. We understand it is permitted that, and then the whole rest of the line happens. Um, casta proserpina, chaste or virtuous or loyal proserpina, can keep on guarding, protecting, cherishing the limen, the threshold, but probably an instance of metonymy here, meaning the house of Patrui, of her uncle, because again, the story, proserpina Persephone married her paternal uncle. All right, with that out of the way, let's scroll down so that uh, the Sybil can start bragging on who exactly it is that she has with her in this boat. Troyus Aeneas, right? Trojan Aeneas Pietat in Signis et Armis, renowned both for his Pietas and for his arms, that is to say, feats in war, which is actually funny because if you've read the Iliad, this is kind of a joke, a mean sort of joke towards Aeneas, given the few times he shows up in the Iliad, he generally is getting his, his, uh, his butt saved by one god or another because he's always biting off more than he can chew, thinking that he himself can take on Diomedes or Achilles. Silly fellow. Anyway, ad genitorem, down to his father, 
Imas Erebi Descenditadumbras. He is descending, he is going down to the uttermost shades or the deepest shades of Erebus, of the underworld, which makes it sound like his dad is in a nasty place, but it turns out he's in the Elysian field, so everything's fine, but we're just emphasizing the depths of it all. And then at last, we undo everything that was just said by pulling out a trump card, right? That golden bow that Aeneas had recovered from that sacred forest uh, earlier in Book 6. Si te nula moet, if nothing moves you, so if, if nothing, you know, affects you at all, and then we see what the nula is actually referring to in the second half of the line, tantai pietatis imago, so if no image of such pietas moves you at all. The nula grammatically does go with imago, given that it's the subject of the verb, but it's often easier in English to understand nulus, nula, as just a strong form of non, so something like in no way at all. So if this image, if, if, if the image of such pietas affects you in no way at all, atra munk, but this stick, bow, but I mean, it's a stick, aperes ramum qui veste la tebat, here she reveals the stick which, so the qui here is going with the ramum, she reveals the stick, the bow, which was hidden in her garment, in her clothing, and then she ends with agnoskas. You should recognize this. This being a subjunctive, by the way, uh, maybe a yusiv subjunctive, maybe an optative subjunctive, kind of depends on what the Sibyl's opinion of Charon is, right? You should recognize this, or maybe you recognize this, but probably more of a yusiv or hortatory subjunctive, reminding him that this bow, this golden bow, grants basically a free ticket for whoever carries it into the underworld. Well, sure enough, this works on Charon straight away. Tu midex ira tum corda residunt. Right? His swollen heart, or perhaps his chest, literally sits down or subsides from anger then at that point. And it's over at this at this point. Uh, moving on, nec plura his. That's it. Like, we probably should understand something like dicta sunt in order to complete the plura. It is indicated as a subject because it probably is. But the meaning is simple enough. Nothing more than this. His, by the way, being an ablative of comparison with plura, no more than these words were said, something like that. But again, we don't need to say all that. Il admirans when erabile donum, we see Charon ille marveling at this incredible gift, fatalis virgai, this gift of the fateful, probably not fatal, fateful branch, longo post tempore visum. So wisum going with the donum, which is referring to the branch, the weir guy, uh, that had been seen again after such a long time. So apparently Charon hasn't seen one of these in a while. Kai rulea wer tit pupim. So he turns the dark boat, because apparently the boat is the similar color to the water, which is generally dark, ripai que propinquat, and he approaches the shore. Once again, ripai, dative, with propinquare, just like we've seen. Moving on from that, uh, in dalia sanimas, thence, or from there, or just simply next, but it could also mean from the shore, uh, other souls, quae per yuga longa sedebant, which along the long shore or beach, in this case, the context tells us what yuga means, because yuga is typically used to mean mountain ranges. Uh, these shades were sitting there along the long beach, deturbat, this is Charon. He shoves them aside. He throws them into turmoil. Laxat foros. And he clears aside, laxat, the deck, the foros. Not a word you see a ton. Simul, akipit alueo. At the same time, he receives, and then we'll get there in one second, have to say a quick word here about alueo. You may have noticed, if you were asked perhaps to scan this line metrically, that there's some weirdness going on. It doesn't seem to work. That is because right here at the end, either alueo is being scanned as a two-syllable word, alueo, or something like that, alueo, through synesis, which is to say we read the E and the O as a single sound when it shouldn't be, or this whole line is hypermetric, 
which means that in order to make it work, what we will do is we will elide the final syllable, this O, into the ingentem in the next line. So something that might sound like simul occupit alwe ingentai neon, which is kind of fun given that Aeneas is being described as massive or huge in this context. He's so big, he spills into the neighboring line, kind of like that person on the airplane that you don't want to sit next to. Regardless, it's not crucial for your understanding, but it is something that m explains why scanning this particular line, if you were asked to do it, is such a pain. So, Ingentai Neon, he is the one that Charon receives onto his boat. Uh, naturally, given that Aeneas has been described as massive, uh, Gemuitsu Pondere Kumba, the boat groans under the weight. Sutilis is in the next line. So referring to the kumba, meaning something like seamed or made of seams or sewn even, which could imply that the boat is made of skin to some extent, but probably just planks of wood that are lashed together. Et multa capit rimosa paludem. And the leaky boat, rimosa, accepted a great deal of the swamp, right? So obviously Aeneas being actual physical mass uh, makes the boat sink down into the swamp. All right, and then we continue on. Transfluin columis, across the river, unharmed. This is being marked as an object because it is referring both to the Watem and the Wirum. Uh, if your text has ES instead of IS, that's because this is an archaic spelling of the accusative plural, third declension, just FYI. Uh, across the river, unharmed, both the priestess and the man, in formi limo, on the shapeless mud, glauca quexponit in ulua. Uh, he, Charon, placed them, these fellows, unharmed, on the shapeless mud and gray grass. Your text might have a proper V here for ulua. It is, in fact, the consonant form. Okay, and then let's scroll down as far as we can, because here he is, Kerberus himself, Kerberus hiking gens, massive Kerberus, la tratu regna trifauci. Now, just have to point out, Virgil is so much fun. There is, in fact, for our boy Kerberus, three pairs of interlocked words in this line because, of course, there are three pairs of interlocked words in this line. Virgil, I see you. You're fun. Uh, Kerberus ingens, massive Kerberus. Latratu trifauci, with, with or by means of his three-throated bark, which is fun. Uh, he personat, he made a great sound. He caused to echo hike regna, these kingdoms, that is to say, the underworld. Adverso recubans imani sinantro, resting huge. This is Kerberus. He's huge. He's ingens and imanis. Uh, in the antro adverso, in the cave opposite. So Aeneas has just gotten off the boat. He looks directly across from him is this cave, and lying in this cave is Kerberus, right at the entrance to it. Okay, so continuing on. Kui, this is referring to Kerberus. Wates horere videns, yam cola colubris. So this is something really neat. We see the priestess looking at his neck, which is shuddering now with snakes. In some of the mythology, going back rather far in reference to Kerberus, Kerberus has snakes all around his neck. And in fact, at one point early enough, there's some evidence to suggest that Kerberus may in fact have been a snake, possibly a hydra kind of creature, who barked, and that particular aspect of him later morphed him into a dog rather than a snake. But it's interesting that Virgil knows enough, it's not surprising, that Virgil knows enough about his mythology to make the snakes an element of Kerberus here. The priestess, upon seeing the necks of, of Kerberus shuddering now with snakes, and then we have to move on to the next line, so pardon the sudden jump, Okay, here we are. Mele soporatet medicatis frugibus ofam obicit. Right? So something that has been made sleepy with honey and with medicated fruits, you know, with medicinal fruits, doctored fruit 
an offam, which is just an offering or a, a, a tidbit, a snack, a morsel. So a morsel, which has been drugged with honey and medicated fruit, other kind of drugged fruit, albeit she threw, right? She threw it, this at him. Hence the cooey back at the start is because of albeit. She threw the morsel to him, indirect object. Ile, fama rabida, triagutra pandan. So what does he do? He opens his three throats. It's not entirely clear how the physiology of this all works, but hey with his rabid hunger, and he kripuit objectam. He snatched the object, the thing that was thrown, objectam, because of ofam. That's how we know. He snatched it. Atquimania terga resolvit. He loosened his massive backs, right? Technically plural, but maybe we read it singular here because of poetry, his massive back. Fusus humi, poured out. Here's his verb fundo again. Poured out upon the ground. Toto quingens extendi terantro, and huge, he stretched or extended across or in the entire cave. And of course, just as Virgil is wont to do, he, we've seen it with Aeolus and other places, here's the whole cave, right, in a bit of chiasmus or word painting, I like to think of it as chiasmus, and here is the massive uh, beast stretched across the, the whole of it. Again, Virgil, I see you. I love you. All right, let's scroll down here to the very end. So Aeneas seizes the approach. Ad eo, right, is where this word ultimately comes from. He seizes the approach, or he takes this opportunity to enter custode sepulto, an ablet of absolute, with the guard not being dead, but certainly buried in sleep, we might say. Ewa ditque keler, and swiftly he escapes. Now, of course, Keller is an adjective, but we can read it as an adverb because Latin loves adjectives and English loves adverbs. So he swiftly escaped the ripam, rip irremeabilis undi, the shore of the unda, the wave or river, irremeabilis. This word ultimately comes from the verb meo meare. You can see the root right there, which means to go. So this is a water that cannot in re again meabilis be traveled over no one gets to go back over the river Styx. you only get the one-way ticket unless again perhaps your name is orpheus but we're not going to go too much into that right now and with that we have come to the end of this particular passage we are in the underworld proper now we have made it across the river Styx, and all that remains is to make it to our father and Kaisis, but there's going to be one brief detour along the way, and that will be the subject of the next video in this series, lines 450 and following, where Aeneas is going to be reunited with Dido, and we will see just how well that goes. So, as ever, if you found this video useful, a like is always appreciated. Otherwise, maximas gratias vobis omnibus et valete.